Welcome to our weekly Friday talk and tour series when we share the opportunity to visit the studios of our wonderful artists and hear about their works and inspiration. These visits are brought to you by the Duncan McClellan Gallery and the DMG School Project of St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you for joining us. I want to um, just say a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, through this process, working with Rich and all of the artists, um, we have had the chance to really, really uh, get to know the artists better than we thought we did and get to know their work. Uh, as much as we worked with them over the years, as much as we've exhibited their works, this uh, process that we're doing has given us an opportunity to uh, really get underneath who they are and what they do. And part of the joy of this is that we're starting to be able to share this with you. And you also are having the same kind of experience when you sign into these things. So um, in working with Rich, Danielle and I and um, Duncan have really enjoyed the process. And I think you're gonna be really surprised um, when you hear him talk about his work. Um, uh, make your comments and questions through the chat box at the bottom. Uh, because Rich has such a wealth of experience and he's such an important person in the glass world, he has a lot to show us, a lot of uh, different types of work. He's going to talk about the process. So the uh, thing will be a full hour. So be prepared for that. And then at the very end, there'll be a, a slide presentation of stills of the work that's in his studio. And that will be available for you after the presentation. So um, we have a lot to cover and we're going to wait for Rich to get back on. Um, Irene, are you? He's here. That's yeah, so wonderful. Everything. Yeah. And believe me, everybody, it's going to be worth all the wait. So uh, Rich, <laughs> we were just talking about how great it's been to work with you, to hear what's behind the work, to get to know you a little bit better. And now um, right. you're able to share this with all of us. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to be there, and thank you for having me. Sure. Um, yeah. you, you've prepared a wonderful presentation, kind of historical presentation of your work. Um, right. That we're going to see in a few minutes. And uh, I've encouraged everyone to make comments and questions through the chat, and we'll relay that to you. Right. So, yeah, it's going to be, it's a short presentation, like you said, and it's hard to encapsulate, you know, 40 plus years of working in this short amount of time without, you know, something has to be left out. So we'll try to cover as much as we can in the time we, we have. Thanks, Rich. All right, um, we'll start, I guess, at the very beginning. Okay. So uh, this is a photo of me working. This is during these strange times in this pandemic, uh, I haven't had access to a hot shop, so it's nice to see a picture that I did actually do this work at one point. Um, this is me working at Duncan's Gallery, and um, we're gonna start with a series I started back in 1983 called the Diamond Cut Series. And this is a piece probably from uh, a year or two after that, maybe 85. And the idea was to create work that, um, I could ma manipulate the form by uh, distributing the weight. And I will explain later on and how that's done. So here you can see uh, something that was probably made a few years after that. It has a lot more texture to it. Uh, kind of looks like an, a rib cage, which is an homage to uh, the breath that we put into these, these pieces as we make them and blow them up. And then um, as I developed the piece, a piece like this is probably 45 inches high or something, it's quite large, using that same technique. So there's a lot of variety of ways to um, uh, approach this technique and make different looking work. So and Rich, were you gaffing for, um, had you finished gaffing for Dale at the time or were you working with Lino? No, no, I, I was working with Dale. I started working with Dale in 1978. Um, and worked with him pretty consistently to the mid nineties, I would say. And uh, so, no, I was, I was doing work at, I mean, that was, that was the whole thing about working with Dale. It was, um, 
a synergetic relationship that uh, he would pay us to help him make his work and that would allow me to have an income that I could actually then go rent a shop and make my work because it's still, you know, it, being a full-time artist is really difficult than selling enough work to finance the, the, the costs of running a hot shop, which is quite expensive. Um, sure. Or, it was a big help with that. This is a this is an image of a early diamond cut wall. This was actually a, a fairly recent um, installation I've done, uh, but I had these pieces all archived. And a very good client of mine asked. I had a, a wall of these up in my studio, and he and he saw it and he said, "Can you do something like that for our space?" And so I ended up using 24 of these these diamond cuts that I had put away, and I thought it was great to create a piece that, that could archive these pieces as a group, because I think they really complement one another. Beautiful. So after the, after the diamond cuts, I, I um, moved into um, in making these shelter pieces. Um, and, and they came about for a number of different reasons. Um, I saw a program on PBS about insects that make their own shelters and they were showing images of these small things that look like this, but they're very tiny. Um, and I had been doing a lot of work with Lino Tagua Pietra and doing a lot of posturali work and cane pickups and that sort of things. And I loved that whole process, but I wanted to do something much larger and more sculptural. And so I developed this process to make these pieces. And um, I, I love how sculptural and how much texture they have. And so it, uh, it is a great, and, and here's a, a shot of uh, an installation I did for a very good client of mine using uh, the cornucopia shapes. From there, we, I was, it's about 1989 and I'm uh, getting married and I was teaching a class at Pilchuck and so I was doing a lot of drawings. I was thinking about relationships and how do they work and how would they look as a three-dimensional object and I came up with this this concept that uh, you have a common goal, belief, central idea that you share and the two of you come together and embrace that concept and so you have the lower part of the piece which is the physical comes and grabs that ball the upper part of the piece is more emotional open to receive things and then you're both entwined around this uh, common concept of life later on i started to introduce these small vessels in these pieces and um, trying to make that central image more precious so i put uh, I, the vessels of course being very important historically um, the vessel, the vessel allowed human beings to travel great distances and, and become interact with one another because they could carry goods and food and, and things to survive on traveling. So the, the vessel was very important in that aspect. So I, I, I would coat it in gold just to kind of accentuate the importance of that central idea. And here's a, a wall of the relationship pieces, which uh, a lot of times I'll display them as pairs or groups of three, because there's a, a great relationship that happens between two of them. And they also, the negative space between two of them, I find quite interesting. And then this is Daniel Craig and, and Casino Royale and this lamp. I, it was pointed out to me, but it's not something I made. I, so I'm still trying to figure out who made this lamp. And so after about five years of a successful marriage, uh, I thought a um, gesture of celebration was appropriate for a relationship. So I started adding these, what I call sprays. It's a copper matrix that slides into that vessel and holds those branches. And um, it gives kind of an imbalance to the relationship visually, but that like, we're putting an edge on the relationship to keep it more interesting. And the branches are also reaching out their exploratory and celebratory all at the same time. So it's a, it's a nice image. So, uh, then in the mid nineties, we're getting ready to have our ch first child. We had a home birth. Um, Adrian was born in our bedroom 
And uh, when he came out, he heard mom crying and he's looking around and I, I started this whole, it was a very profound moment. Um, the idea that this new, this newborn could come out and actually recognize that sound that he'd been hearing in this <laughs> in the womb for for nine months um, and looking around for it and this whole concept of looking and seeing and and uh, so I I was thinking about well this really changes my life and so I call these the aperture pieces because um, your eye works like an aperture the seeing and um, I have to be open as well. To new concepts and new ways of living. So the whole process of the aperture opening and me seeing life differently was a really important thing. So I started making these pieces uh, using just a central element, kind of an eyeball shape, and and these two pieces joining it. And as it as it were, it, um, when I started making these, I was invited to be a artist and resident of Waterford Crystal in Ireland, and was allowed to go over and work with this lead crystal. And this is one of the lead crystal pieces I made in Ireland. And, and this is a way I, I approach a lot of new work is that I'll work it out in clear and and kind of figure out the sculptural aspects to it and then later I'll start adding color to them. But, uh, the pieces became upright and more complex just like kids grow up and become more complex. And um, next slide please. And then I start adding color to them to, to kind of uh, acknowledge that joyful growth and uh, journey that uh, the kids and Janet and I were on. Um, 2001, um, I was in Hawaii on vacation with my son and my wife and uh, we had an earthquake here in Seattle and this is one of the, one of the shelves. We lost uh, 300 pieces during this earthquake and there was a lot of broken glass um, and as it were uh, it was also when my daughter was conceived and uh, eventually her nickname became earthquake but uh, from that there was these broken pieces that I really found interesting and so uh, this pod series as I call it these seed like things um, I developed because I found them most interesting so I, I kind of connect that with Colette. Uh, then uh, the, still in the Aperture series, I started making them in solid because I wanted to explore how they would look um, in a solid form and also uh, using the optics of uh, solid glass to um, change the appearance of these pieces. And so I, I developed this co uh, this uh, technique to colorize these pieces. So the four the four elements that surround that central sphere are um, geometric and profile. So this this piece has three sides, and only on one side is there color. So as you uh, look at this detail in the next slide, you can see how the color is kind of elusive, even when it's uh, the piece is not moving at all. Um, and I'll explain later on how exactly that, that technique is done. We'll see a video, I think, at the end of this. So this is another example of that. Um, the thing about having the color on the one side is as you walk up around the piece, it, it, uh, the color appears and disappears as you uh, move around the piece. So it's very active, it's, it's less static than just applying a very traditional way of color to uh, the blown glass. So these are just a few examples. They got more complex and bigger. And um, so I started doing these pieces with multiple balls and, and kind of a different format, but it's still all around that concept of the aperture. Um, and then uh, I started just, so this, this piece is, um, it's two pieces that is actually glued together in the, in the center at that very and, uh, and Rick, context. Yeah, Mary? Yeah, can you talk a little bit about where the spheres, your concept for the spheres came from? I'm sorry, say that again? Can you, t can you talk a little bit about the concept of where the spheres come from? How uh, important they are to you? 
really, I, I, you know, in the beginning, I just liked the spheres and they seemed like, um, especially the solid spheres work. I mean, they work just like an aperture or just like your eyeball. So if you were to put, as you have something behind that solid sphere, it actually gets turned upside down and backwards. So it gets reversed just like the way your eyeball sees everything. And then the image is projected on that. But it's also, it's, the sphere is, is um, the most stable shape in the universe, as I understand it. And um, because it has equal pressure all the way around it. And so it's a very, very stable thing. And it just seemed, um, I don't know, with these pieces, it's like that sphere seemed to be the appropriate um, form to have these elements either, they either look like they're coming from it or going towards it. It kind of depends on who you are and how you see these things. But I like the idea of, of that central form being still the most important part of the piece and that, that these, these tendricles, that they, they come either off the piece or are coming towards the piece and joining with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then, um, so this is an example of uh, what I call an apropos, which is, still kind of an extension of the aperture series but uh i was trying to make smaller and uh, more intimate pieces so here's a short video uh, and right here i'm uh i'm making a rondelle that will be cooled and then later cut up into make the panels that colorize these pieces so here i'm making this flat round disc and then this, this kind of jumps over, but this is the central ball, but you can see I've cut up some panels and it's actually encapsulated in this, in this crystal ball. And There's we're going to see the panels later too, right? There they yeah. are. And so here you see me sliding one of those fused panels into a graphite mold, and then coming over and stuffing clear glass around. And so I'm picking up that colorized panel on one surface of this five-sided piece. And it's picked up and cleaned off. And then the, we do use that to start assembling the piece. So here you see one of the arms and it has a number of balls already connected to it. Here I'm stretching that, that solid glass with the color on just one side. We're gonna connect it to this piece as we make this apropos. Huh. So there, it's a, the whole process is, it, it takes a couple hours to make one of these. There's four or five of them working on it. And uh, they're really quite complex in the way that they're made. And that's just the blowing, not the panels themselves. No, that's, this is just the making of the piece. Um, there's no air in this piece at all. It's all solid. So that I've not introduced any air into the molten glass. And so that gives you a little bit of an idea of how I apply the color on these pieces. And is that at the Tacoma Museum? And this is at the, the, yeah, the Museum of Glass down in Tacoma, yes. And you can see I'm yelling at people and telling them what to do, being real bossy. But here it is, you can see again. And again, we'll, we'll look at some of these pieces in a, in a more live format, so you'll see how the color does actually, it's not static, it moves around a lot and jumps. I find that really interesting, these pieces. So I, from, from those apropos and the solid apertures came the geometric pieces. Um, I was just sitting around and I said, what, you know, I'd been working with these graphite molds that are either square, triangles, five-sided, diamond shaped, they, different profiles that these, which shape these, um, oh boy, shape these things. And I thought, well, what if I just made geometric forms and glued them together to make sculpture? And I really, I got excited about the idea. I wanted to make a lot of texture on the, on the forms. I wanted them to be fast and simple. And I found this book, it's called The Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe. And it talks about 
mathematics in nature and how mathematics is a language that was developed to describe how nature works. And so you can look through nature and find using the Fibonacci curve or the golden mean that, that it's apparent in foliage and flowers and insects in just the way trees grow. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's just not really that apparent. And I like that concept that it's not so apparent that you have to kind of search for it. And so these pieces, I was just trying to create circular forms, spiral forms uh, doing this. I love the texture on the surface. Um, I love that these forms are actually self-supporting. Some of the, the earlier pieces, I, had, I used stands, metal stands to support the pieces, but I like the ones without the metal stands much better. Um, And uh, this is using a six, a lot of the pieces previous to these, the piece, the elements were four-sided. These are six-sided pieces, which creates a more chaotic kind of setup, but it's still a spiral. Um, the name of the book is A Beginner's Guide. <laughs> what is it? Now I forgot. A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe. I think it's, uh, I can't remember the author's name. So here it is. Here's a spiral that is um, made of solid blocks uh, using the same coloration technique as I did with the apertures. And um, so the, the color on these are really quite active as well. I mean, they appear and reappear and disappear and, and as you move about the piece. There's a lot of cold working, lens work kind of things to, to really get that color to jump around. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm kind of moving away from the whole concept of that sphere, that, that spiral, that, that perfect circle, and stacking these things in a more, and this is a pretty uniform way, but you're still getting, using that concept of mathematics. And then from these, uh, I started what I call these stacked pieces, which is still using the geometric forms, but they're more random and this again this is this is what I was talking about how I like that um, that systematic geometric building of the pieces and you have a very systematic way of making them but they look rather random and chaotic because I can use them to make all sorts of wild shapes and sculptures and the balance is perfect also. So just as in nature, it looks random, but there's beautiful balance. Right, yeah. And I, the other thing is you'll notice this is standing on these very fine points of the, and it's the other thing I, I love about glass is that it's, you know, it, it's simultaneously really strong and yet really fragile. And uh, I like to accentuate kind of that aspect of them both to have them appear. So they're really, you know, I, of course, I, I make these things and I want them to be very durable so people don't have to be afraid to have them in their homes. But I also want to accentuate that, that, that they, they can have this strength and still this fragility about them. This is a piece that uh, Duncan has in the gallery. I don't know if Daniel was ever to, able to zoom in on this, but uh, there's a lot of carving that happens on the ends of those, those elements. And this is a, another example. Um, this is a piece that Duncan placed in a private residence in Georgia, I believe. And here it is in installation. And this is a piece called Brazil. Um, just because I love Brazil. <laughs> so um, this is a little video of me doing a piece I, I did last fall. Um, in a private residence and the piece is uh, about 65 of these elements, the biggest elements I've ever used. They're about 24 inches in length and uh, weigh about 15 pounds a piece and there's 60, oh I don't know, Here's a, that's a better image of them. There's like 65 or 70 of them on this thing. It stands about eight feet tall and it's about four feet in diameter. And it's about three feet off the ground. So the top of the piece is like 10 feet in the air, 10, 11 feet in the air, mounted on top of this fountain, this giant marble fountain. 
I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I spent a lot of time on the water, fishing, skiing, uh, hanging out on beaches. We'd go hunt for arrowheads. Um, and uh, everywhere you go, there's so many, especially in South Puget Sound, there's little lighthouses on all the points. And I was just fascinated even as a kid with the Fresnel lens that was used in these lighthouses. And so this is, these pieces are kind of my homage to the Fresnel lens. And what I, here I am making one at uh, Duncan McClellan's gallery uh, in his hot shop. And then I think we have a small video of us working on one. <laughs> I think I'm going in for the last gather here, which are, these are quite substantial pieces. They're probably, I don't know, 35 pounds of glass or so. I'm just stripping a little bit off so I get a nice even gather. And then we blow a nice big kind of egg shape. And then I, I have a wrap that has a what we call a veil on the outside. So there's a thin veil of color that coats clear glass. So it makes the glass all appear whatever color it is. And then you see I got that color all shaped up and heated up and then we apply this wrap, probably about a 10 pound bit there. Wow. And I just it, it, trail it on there easy as could be. <laughs> you make it look easy. It's easy once you know how. <laughs> so the idea is to, uh, once you get this whole thing put together, we try to blow them up as fast as we can. And so we maintain a lot of that texture. And what it does is in in the sections in between the wraps become lenses. So there's, um, so as you walk around the piece, you, the, the thing actually seems to be moving as you move around the piece. So it's another one of the pieces that has to be, um, but you can see the scale of it. It's quite large. Um, uh, but it, yeah, I just, I really like how active these pieces are even when they're sitting still. So here we're just finishing. So we we blow this thing up and then I poke a hole in the bottom of it and put another blowpipe on it and then I close off the top and then we blow it up some more. So we I tried to you know make a nice spherical shape that seems pretty um, symmetrical from top to bottom. And then I like to display them kind of on the oblique so they the uh, rather than straight up and down. So here I'm just cleaning up the top of the piece. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, good. Yes, thank you. So here we are just knocking the piece off. So that's almost two and a half feet, three feet. I'm that's sorry. Almost, it's almost two and a half feet across. Oh no, it's more. It's more like two feet. It's, it's probably 22, 24 inches in diameter. But yeah. that's that's a big piece of glass, especially when you. They're pretty thick because it makes the optics. You can see how optically active it is just with a still. You know, so you need that thickness to help make those lenses work really well. Hmm. So these are a few images of pieces that I've done, special pit commissions. This is a uh, geometric chandelier that I did for a client, a very good client of mine. Um, and this is it in situation. It, the pieces are probably four feet long, four and a half feet long, about three feet, three plus feet wide. And then this is in their dining room with the Alexander Calder behind it, a very nice presentation. Um, this is a lighting project I did in a private corporation here in Seattle. These these globes are 24 inches in diameter on this kind of industrial uh, installation. Um, so private, uh, private residence in Minnesota, I made this piece for. And uh, let's see another chandelier I did for a uh, 
residence over in Bellevue across Lake Washington from where I am. You can see a couple of my pieces in the background there. This is a screen I did. It's about four feet tall and probably six and a half, seven feet long um, that I did as a partition for uh, a dining room to, to separate the dining room from the, um, from the hallway. And uh, this is a piece I just did for me, but I ended up, uh, it was purchased by uh, a gentleman who's going to put it in the front of a um, preschool as a kind of a, in a bay window in the front of the preschool. So, okay, so that's the presentation. And uh, thank you, Rich. Um, we have a couple questions. Okay. Um, uh, from Amini, she asked if those, the geometric pieces like the one you have behind you, uh, uh -huh. can they be lit from the inside? Well, the, one, the ones hanging up here, that's, a, that's another chandelier and it's, it will be lit from the inside. Um, right now it's, it's just got some light spotted down there because I haven't wired it for, for the lighting, but it will be lit from the inside. And then the piece on the table, no, those are just spotlights on those. There's, so, but so the big installation. The the, yeah, but the nature of, of the elements, actually it grabs that light and, and they do, there's a reflective quality that as the light passes through the glass, it hits the other side and bounces back. So it gets that kind of glow to it. Right. Yeah, you had mentioned how optically active the pieces are. And yeah. uh, that shows throughout all your work, your understanding of the way light interacts with the glass. Right, um, right. Yeah, Jason also asked, uh, Jason's on, on board with us, Jason yeah. Chakravarty, and he asked how big that hammer is. The hammer. Oh, the hammer? Uh, <laughs> it's, I don't know, I think it's about four feet long. I don't remember, oh, but yeah, yeah the, the, the play school sets like, I wanna say, five and a half feet by four feet high or something. The cylinders are probably eight inches across or something like that, <laughs> you know? And I did all the woodwork on them too. I have a woodworking and metal studio that I work with. Thor would be jealous. Yes, he would be. <laughs> but he, Thor would use the big hammer. So do you do many commissions, Rich? What's that? Do you do many commissions? I do commissions all the time. So uh, it kind of depends. I mean, um, that, that commission I did uh, of the big piece, the eight foot tall piece on top of the fountain, that was actually a cold call off my web page. And we negotiated, we, that started in February of 2019 and I installed it in November and didn't even start working on it until May. So there was a lot of negotiations that happened with a piece of that scale and make sure everybody was covered and safe and, and that everybody, you know, was happy with the way it turned out. We got it just right. And I thought it turned out really great. So yeah, but I do commissions. I'll do commissions for chandeliers. I'll do commissions of, if you see a piece you like, but you want it in a different color or that kind of thing, of course, I'll, I'll work with anyone. Thanks. Uh, one more question before we move on to your studio tour. Eve Benton is asking, what are you working on now with the COVID? Has that changed your plans? Uh, and look at look at the background of my picture, Rich. I think you're going to be able to see a lot of stuff that I made. Rich. How come I got? How come it mutes like that? Can you guys hear me now? We can. That was an accident. Okay. Um, so I made a number of pieces. Uh, and I, I was lucky enough to um, actually rent the hot shop before it went off and made a number of pieces. And so I will, I'll sh a lot of what I'll show you today is, is some new work that I'm working on. I, I'm doing some new stuff with the diamond cut pieces. I keep going back and revisiting that process and trying to make different shapes. And I think I'm onto something pretty cool. So I'm doing that, uh, this piece right here on the table is a piece I made in March or something. It was stuff I'd, I'd made the parts and then that. And then uh, right now I'm working on a um, metal sculpture 
that's going to be yeah. probably about the same scale as um, the piece on the fountain. It's going to be wow. quite large, and then it'll have glass elements attached to it. Awesome. So, yeah, so I've, I've got that in process in the back room, um, and then uh, hopefully the hot shops are going to start opening up pretty soon. I know everybody's eager to see your studio, so why don't we start there and we'll see some of the work, some of the pieces that are that are right. available you might be working with. So, okay, so here we are. Uh, for bigger. So here we are in the Bemis building. This is where my studio is. And uh, Danielle, this is my shop. Can you pause it? Okay, it, directly in the middle and back. I don't know if you can enlarge the screen for yourselves, but um, that's the metal piece that I'm working on right there for as, as a new piece. So go ahead, that's fine. But that's my metal shop, wood shop, sandblasting room, storage, shipping and packing, all that stuff. We're walking down the hallway here, you got some diamond cuts. And we're gonna go around real fast and kind of just look at the studio in general here. Um, we've got some Chihuly charcoal drawings there, a, a uh, Dan Daly painting. It's a Steve Jensen uh, carved pole right there. Uh, you can see the, the relationship pieces, and the, that beautiful violet spiral, and the chandelier, and a wall of solid apertures, spray piece. So this is, and rest assured, my studio does not look like this unless I'm doing something like this. So I wanted to focus on these pieces just a little bit. These two pieces you see here that look kind of odd. And, uh, uh oh, we kind of skipped over it. Anyway, can you pause right. again? Yeah, we so were talking. The, the piece with the white and red piece, that broken piece up on the, the speaker there, that's one of the things that was left over from the earthquake that I developed the pod pieces from. Just. Kind of, and there's a couple more of them on the left there as well. So go ahead, run it. So these are just some old historic, there's an early aperture piece, or I mean, uh, relationship. Kind of a better look at those Chihuly charcoal drawings. Um, this is an early, early piece, probably late 70s, uh, blown into a wet clay mold. This is my homage to glass blowing. And this is a shelter made at Waterford Crystal. Um, now, can you uh, talk a little bit briefly about the Waterford Crystal piece? Can I, you think talk it, I, I think it's on, I will talk about it later on in the video. Okay, sounds great. Okay, so that's a print. I did a pilchuck, the spray piece. Um, like I said, the solid apertures. It's an early geometric pieces. I thought that would be a nice scale to work at. It's turned out to be huge. This is a brand new piece, Eve, that I'm working on, that white and primary colored one. Um, all these Lovely. pieces. Yeah, Very nice. All these pieces against the wall here, these apropos are brand new. Uh, that's a brand new piece. That's the one that's actually sitting behind me now. So most of this work is all brand new. And then this is a, a poster from working with Dale, and he left me a message, and it says "richer, thicky, thicker all around." So you can sing that, go "richer, thicker all around, chihuly, chihuly." I guess, but anyway, it makes me laugh. So this is this is the studio I get to come to every day and work, uh, figure this stuff out, make pieces. I have some of my private collection here. There's a painting by Italo Sconga. It's the, a blue piece that Duncan used to have in his gallery, in my FICA. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, freestanding screen by Dick Weiss. Uh, this is the office area, all my catalogs and, and stuff of all the work I've ever done. Uh, some prints, and pencil drawings, Dan Daly Warthog. Uh, just kind of an overview of the whole studio. Uh, some optic lens. I think I think I walk by these so you can kind of see what I'm talking about is the activity that happens when you walk by those pieces. They look like they're moving. Yeah, they people walk by them and sometimes they jump because they think they're rolling. 
This is a little block of solid glass that I, I had left over from making a piece. And so I carved it up and uh, just keep it around to look at it. You can see all the lens work and stuff like that. This is one of the pieces from Waterford Crystal where it was such a great opportunity for me to go in there and um, I'd just make these forms and then I'd take a marker and mark what I wanted to have carved on it and I'd give it to the carvers and they'd finish it for me. It was fantastic. Just, it's the way I like to do cold work. Not at all. <laughs> Were you on a residency there? Yeah, I was the first artist in residence in this program. Uh, it was kind of a result of um, uh, the Chihuly over Venice project. So here I am, I'm going to talk a little bit about the relation or the diamond cut pieces and I'm grabbing this piece and this is one of the really early ones where I, the blank that I'd make, I'd actually remove a wedge from the blank and you'll see what I'm talking about with the blank here in just a second. So it's quite smooth. It didn't have the texture I wanted, but you could still see the layers of color, multiple layers of color. Now this is, this is the same process, but I approached cutting the blank differently, where I just made slices in the blank rather than removing these almost these like lemon wedge sort of shapes from the, the piece. So I think I grabbed the, uh, so here I grabbed the, the little blank and a piece. So this is a small blank and the blank that size would make a piece that size, right? And so the, you can see the scale difference in the big diamond cuts as opposed as some something like that. So the blanks are, are solid with multiple layers of color. I make two vertical cuts and three horizontal cuts. And then it's put back in an oven, a bubble dropped into it, and as you blow into the blank, it separates those cuts, right? So a piece that was cut like that, you can see where the cuts were on this piece and it would make a piece similar to that. So that's, and that's how those big pieces have all vertical cuts. And then these pieces are some of the newer ones I've been working on where they're completely closed form. So there's actually an air hole in the bottom of the piece that I use to inflate and close the top. So I'm kind of working them in reverse from bottom to top rather from top to bottom as I finish the piece. So it makes for some interesting form work. I really like the one on the left there, the tall one. Um, so what am I doing here now? Rich, somebody asked, uh, why do you call it a blank? A blank? Because, well, because um, it, it, it's like, what, the whole process is uh, reliant on me cutting the piece in such a way that I can allow the weight dis the difference in weight distribution to determine what the form's gonna be. So it's like I'm working with a blank canvas, right? And so it's just this kind of socky cup shaped thing that's quite thick and I can cut it in many different ways as you saw with the early diamond cut pieces like on the diamond cut wall and um, so it, I, I just approach it like it, it's, I've, I've applied the color, I got the blank, and now I, I'm gonna figure out how to, what the form's gonna look like by the way I cut the piece up. Thank you. And, and uh, that, that makes sense. So we're talking about the relationship pieces here. I'm holding it out like a fish so it looks bigger. Um, but anyway, it's same thing. It's, um, you got, the, I'm talking about, the top and the bottom coming together and embracing that central core being very important. That's it. That's an early piece there that was actually in the slide presentation. And then they develop into these with the, the vessels. And then of course they um, evolved into the spray pieces, which you see here. And I think I'm just, yeah, I was just moving the camera. <laughs> and uh, focusing on that. So I'm, I'm going to go over, so this spray piece, so it has a metal matrix there that I'm talking about and see how it slides out of the vessel and slides back in. So it actually comes apart in two parts, but it snugs in there really tight and it's very stable. And these are pieces, the spray pieces, if anyone's interested, is just, I don't, um, so I do those on commission basis only. 
So this is a shelter piece um, made of Waterford crystal. Uh, the concept of the shelter is like the insects make their own shelter. It's a, they're spirals using cane and um, kind of moving on apparently. I have to see where we're going here because I don't remember what I was talking about. So, um, oh, we're talking about the aperture. So again, uh, just kind of to go over it again, it was uh, two entities it's, it's, uh, creating this eyeball shape. And then of course, um, it, they became these tall vertical shapes that still have these elements that look like they're either coming to or coming or going away from that central core. Richard, how long did it take you to clean up the place? It looks beautiful. <laughs> Weeks. <laughs> no, I don't know. I worked pretty hard for a whole day to clean it up. I mean, all this stuff, everything you see here that's out because of that earthquake, I'm quite, not quite so cavalier with my work anymore because everything else before that, everything was stored standing up. And so now everything lays down on foam. And I put foam in between it and cover it with plastic. So normally this whole space, I have 3,000 square feet here and the whole space has got all these little islands of glass on foam with plastic over the top of it. So here you can kind of see, I think, we, can we back up a little bit, Danielle? Just a little bit, okay. I think you can see how clear the piece on the right is. I'm pointing at it right there. But there's a ton of color in this piece. Go ahead and roll it. And uh, I think I come in, grab this, and I come in. And you'll see as I, you can start to see the color appear as right. I move to the side of the piece, right? So it has this, it has this surprise element to it where the uh, color is just kind of hidden in some of these pieces almost in totality. And then you look at it from a different angle and the piece, piece looks entirely clear. So it's kind of the case, you can kind of pick it up in some of these other apertures too, that, that bluish green one there, you can see how it, the color really moves around. And that's all from the pickup of the panels, correct? That's all from the shape of the leg itself, that element is three-sided and having just the color on one side. Um, so I think I'm going over to the apropos here, and these are all brand new pieces that were done this year, uh, in the early part of the year. Um, and so they're all colored the same way. There's a panel of, of colored glass on one side, and I'm just, I think I go, so there's a square mold. And the torch that's pointing down at this is how we keep the, the molds warm. So that's connected to a gas source and then the flame just candles and keeps that graphite at about 900 degrees. And we use a little buddy there to uh, help us out in the shop so I don't have to hire a guy to do that. Uh, a lot of times I'll name tools that do work for other people. Um, anyway, you can see these pieces, um, Again, quite dynamic. And so here's a panel. And that panel, I think I go over and, and show you, is put on a posturale plate. So we're gonna move on over here real quick. And you can see there's a box of color. These are all color rods. This is how we color the glass. This is the way the color looks in the beginning. It's all and there's a bag of tools, right, that I have to take. And then I got all these plates, these ceramic plates that I use to preheat these panels. And I'm bringing one out of the box now. And so it's a, a ceramic plate. It's probably, I don't know, 12, 13 inches by eight inches wide. And the panel is put on there and preheated on top of that plate. And then the whole thing is, is put in the glory hole. So the glass actually becomes my, uh, plastic in, in its, you know, it has flexibility to it. Of course, then it's slid in there and then I drop in with a clear glass as you saw in the video. 
and this creates the coloration on the back side of the pieces. And the spheres themselves also have small spherical panels that are cased inside them. So these are, these are some pieces, like I said, recent pieces. Um, and so I'm just taking some time here to show you. And some, a new thing I've been doing with this, um, Eve, is I've been carving on these apropos. And we'll get some a close up of that as we get to this last piece, I believe. Beautiful cold work. Beautiful. And uh, texturizing these, uh, these spheres. So it kind of again it affects the way the color is presented, and what's also kind of cool about it again you can you really can't I don't know but you can actually see inside the sphere because that that cold working actually defines that exterior and you can see inside the sphere looking through one of the element the the long elements of these pieces. Beautiful. So the cold working almost enhances the color, brings your eye right to it. It brings your eye right to it, but it also, um, it's kind of hard to tell, but it actually makes the color move more, hmm. which is, I find very interesting. But it, it yeah, it's, it softens it, but it also accentuates it at the same time. Again, looking inside the sphere, so they're like mini lenses. Yeah. So here's a piece without any carving on it. Beautiful. Yeah. And then I think I come over and so this piece is is different from the rest and then the way it's colored, I use colored thread rather than colored panels. I think I talk about that. At least I thought I did. So yeah, I'm going over, and this is, this is getting close to when I, I have a little accident, and you'll see. I don't know. You could turn on the sound and we could hear it happen. So anyway, um, the threads I'm talking about, so here's, a bunch of racks of thread. These are the panels, and these are the panels with the thread fused on them. And so rather than having a solid color panel to work from, I'm working with clear panels, and then I lay the thread on top, like a painting. These threads are very thin, very flexible, right? And you, uh, so I do this dumb thing. Now watch this, see there's under there, and boom, there it goes. <laughs> I'm going, oops! There it is. <laughs> Don't worry, I can fuse it back together. It happens actually more often than I'd like, but they do, are fixable. Anyway, so um, anyway, that's why I have to walk around all this stuff to get back to where I was. So that's how the coloration is done in that, that one apropos. I think I forgot something here. What did I forget? These discs. Oh, just a shot of the rondelles. So these are the rondelles. And you can see I've been cutting them up to make the panels. And I'll, I'll sit and it takes me, I don't know. I mean, it can take me more than a day just to cut a whole, uh, a set of panels for one piece. So I have to, there's a lot of prep work that goes into these solid pieces. Um, and so anyway, so that's all of that, which takes us to the aperture pieces, or I mean, the, excuse me, the geometrics. And these are some geometrics I have. These are all really new pieces. Um, and the geometrics came from working with the geometric molds. And again, like I said, I thought, what if I just make geometric forms? Here we are with a solid geometric. 
using the same coloring process as with the apropos and the apertures. And that's, like, this is an original one, which I thought was going to be a reasonable scale. Turns out it's about 42 inches in diameter. <laughs> it's a really big piece. I can barely lift it. And this is a brand new piece that I was working on. It's kind of a long backstory. But anyway, uh, the colored elements are not glass. They're styrofoam, bondo, and auto paint. Um, because I needed something light to hang off the end of that was glass, the white glass elements. This is a nice violet spiral. So I think, um, and this is an older, this is a early piece too, probably four and a half feet high. And they're stacked, there's two, actually two pieces standing, one standing on top of the other. Um, smaller, more intimate. And a lot, a lot of what I did with the geometric early on, I wanted to make them um, monochromatic, essentially, or maybe two colors, but very subtle in the color applications, not you know a lot of different colors like this piece, uh, mostly because I wanted to focus on the sculptural forms and not detract from the sculptural form with the colors. Uh, here you see they can they not only get attached at the base, but they can also crisscross and attach at other spots too. And a lot of times I do that just to create stability in the piece. But these are all very intuitive pieces. I just start working on them and I kind of follow where they take me. And then they're done when I feel like they're done. And are they assembled hot, Rich? No, they're are all they assembled cold. They're all use a uh, Hextall glue to glue them together, very strong glue. Um, unbelievably strong glue. You can see how this piece is, you have this cluster of pieces just hanging off this one point. But I, I'm fully confident that uh, the glass itself would let go before the bond or the scene where the bond is. Everyone is loving your sense of color. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, people call me a colorist. I don't, I didn't know that. But here's another example of, of the strength and, and kind of that tension that you can create with these pieces. Again, like I said, they're very intuitive. And this one just started to kind of grow off to the side and uh, I just went with it. and. You know, I could have brought it all the way over and made an arch like you saw in the slide presentation. If I mm -hmm. But there, I can only do one gluing at a time. So you see a piece like this where it has, I don't know how many pieces are on that, maybe 25 pieces there. I can only do one gluing uh, with the hex doll probably every other day. So it takes me, what, a couple months to maybe make a piece like this. So I generally work on five or six pieces at once. Here's a spiral piece. And at one point we're gonna, we're gonna look, cause you know, I started this geometric thinking I'm moving off in an entirely different direction. And you know, the forms look different. They don't look anything like the relationships. They don't look like the apertures. Of course they don't look, the diamond cuts are kind of different than that. But here are some just uh, elements on the floor. And I think I talk about the scale of, of these things here a little bit now, but as we come around this piece, you can look and I get right down here and there's a sphere that goes all the way through the piece. So, at, you know, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> so that, that whole, there's no sphere, it's just, there's a hole. There's a round hole in the piece and it, it just takes me back to the relationships, the early relationships or the early apertures. These are the scale of the molds that I used for that installation on the fountain. Uh, just to give you an idea how much bigger they are, we're gonna go over here, and this is what I call a standard eight mold, right there. And so I'm gonna take this over and just, that's the size that comes out of the standard eight. And I'm gonna take this over and put it next to this mold so you can see the difference. So when you have to gather glass to create a piece that big, 
it, it, it's almost exponential in the way you have to add the glass. It's just not two plus two and four plus four. It's, it's like multiplied up. So, um, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, here's, here's a bunch of other molds. He said, so I, what I do is I mock all this stuff up in cardboard before I make these pieces to kind of make the forms. And then I take cardboard templates to a metal guy and he cuts the plates for me. And then I have to bring them back and, and kind of fine tune them and stuff and, and build the molds myself. But, uh, so these are all molds that I made. And here's the smallest mold I made. You can see how tiny it is next to a standard eight. So anyway, do you make your own molds, Rich? Do you make What's your that? own molds? Do you make I your make own molds? I make my own molds. So let's back it up a little bit, Danielle, please. I don't know how we're doing time-wise. Okay. We're fine. We're doing good? Sure. Yeah, okay. So anyway, um, small mold, been there. So this piece is the size of that piece there, right? And it goes, it gets blown into that mold. And you can see I poke a hole where that red dot is, attach a blown honey, close that in, and go into the second mold. So each, each one of these elements go into two molds. You can see over on the floor there. Ah, the optic lens pieces. We're going to just walk around those a little bit more just to get another idea of how active these things are. This is just from walking around because now we're going to go over to the revolving plinth and just look at this for a while and you'll really see how <laughs> how those those ropes that I wrapped around the outside of there really start to move as this thing spins. Very meditative. Yeah. So this is a chandelier. I think this is getting close to the end that I did. It's very similar to the one that I had in the uh, residence in, in Los Angeles. Um, and it is available. This is sandblasted. The other one wasn't. And thanks, Diane. And I think that's it. Thank you, Rich. We have a couple questions. All right. Um, first of all, everyone's loving your color, your sense of balance, uh, you know, your sense of uh, understanding of the way light works with the glass. Right. Um, someone is asking, let's see, uh, let, how you achieve the opaqueness on your geometric pieces? It, the surfaces are sandblasted, and then they're treated with a, uh, a coating that gives, brings them up to kind of a satin finish. So most of the colors are transparent. And um, hang on one second. You see this? This is, a, this is a piece before it's sandblasted, right? So it's very transparent. And you can see where I plugged the hole and where the punny, the blow punny was attached. And then it was finished on this end. And then, this is the way a sandblasted surface looks. So you can see the difference between the two. So you Perfect. Can and then way. this, you can see how dry it looks. You get a little bit of moisture on there and it starts to bring it back up to a satin finish. So that's what the finish does. It creates that satin appearance. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rich. That was so awesome. There was so much beautiful work and I know there was even more behind it. Um, Let's see, uh, someone else is asking, uh, they'd be interested to know what music, if any, you listen to while you're working. What's your inspiration? Um, okay, in the hot shop, generally somebody takes care of the music and they play whatever they want. Uh, one guy I like 
like working with. He plays nothing but oldies. But when I'm in the studio, um, I probably listen to music less than half the time. It's pretty much just silent here and I'm just lost in my thoughts. But if I do, I just put on, we have a local radio station that streams on live. Many of you might know it, KEXP. And um, they play, they play all genre of music. So it's really a diverse and, and they play anything, you know, from jazz to classic to rock to punk to metal to everything. And it's cool because they, they mix it up and I don't have to do any DJing. So that's, I just rely on them. And it's a nonprofit. So if you look them up and they, you want to donate and give them some money, it'd be great because they stream worldwide and you, they have an unbelievable following. So I'm very proud to be in the city where KEXP is. Thanks, Rich. Um, it, are you, is your studio open at all during this time? Uh, I'd, I'd be more than happy to do a, a visit. So, you know, we just make an appointment and we could, you know, have people come by. I'm, I feel pretty confident that we can do it safely. Well, another thing that we are offering our uh, clients is if you want to have a virtual tour with Duncan and Richard, um, if you're interested in that, we can uh, set that up for you. So yeah. uh, please contact uh, Irene or Duncan if you'd like to make that happen. That would be so, great. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. Okay. Thanks. Duncan, uh, I know that uh, you want to thank everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. That was really incredible to be in your studio. I enjoyed uh, the visit. Uh, I think it was last year. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, gonna... you, you spent time cleaning it up. Uh, <laughs> it really looked wonderful. Um, yeah. And thank you so much for sharing this today. I want to thank everybody for being on and, uh, and I really appreciate your support. Um, uh, well, this is uh, been wonderful to have you and we look forward to seeing you maybe next week. As we're saying goodbye, we're going to just run the presentation, the stills um, that we have that we took out of your video and everybody can see that and get a copy as well. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Uh, but here, here they are, they're coming along. We just took some excerpts and uh, if anyone has any questions about these, feel free to contact us. Sounds great. Yeah. So what time is it now in Seattle, Richard? 2.15. Have you had your pizza yet? Have I eaten? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ate you before you got on here. I made, right. I didn't want to eat while I was talking. <laughs> So all of these pieces in your studio are available, correct? That is correct. Some really wonderful work. And how about that purple piece that we just saw? What's the dimensions on that approximately? Is it the geometric? Correct. Uh, I have to hang on. Well, just a guess. It's right behind me here. Can you see it now? I can't yeah. see. It's, uh, it's 21 by 21 by 23 or so. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, if you want dimensions of any of this work, just let me know and I'll, I can send you. Thanks. And again, if anyone would like a private tour with Rich and Duncan, this piece here, um, just let us know. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very much.